I wait outside of the grocer, holding three fingers to my chest. The streets are empty, and the wind is cruel. I would do much better seeking shelter from the coming blizzard, but the thirst keeps me on the street. A man approaches me. He wears a heavy jacket, but his hands are bare. We briefly speak. His fingers are red and swollen, yet with some effort he positions them. We wait outside of the grocer, each holding two fingers to our chest. Across the road, a young man watches us. His clothes are tattered and his right eye is bruised. He's far too young to be one of us. In a just world, the boy would be off the streets and getting some sort of an education. In a just world, he would have a future. Yet we do not live in a just world. After a minute or two of watching us, the boy crosses the street. He doesn't make eye contact. He just holds a solitary finger to his chest and waits. The air grows violent, each gust of icy wind reminding us that this part of the globe cannot be tamed. We should be huddled around a fire somewhere, far away from the elements, yet the thirst will not let us. The thirst forces us to stand in the blizzard. The three of us wait outside of the grocer, each holding a single finger to our chest. We're waiting for one more, right? Asks the boy. One more, brother, one more. Says the man with the puffy hands. Unless you're feeling like a big spender, that is. The boy doesn't answer. Instead, he takes out a crumpled pack of cigarettes. There's only two left. I try not to stare, but I do. Reluctantly, he offers me one. Eagerly, I accept. The youth lights up his cigarette immediately, but my efforts are foiled by the howling sky. The boy's plastic lighter refuses each spark. I put the cigarette behind my ear and wait for the wind to die down. It doesn't. Real cool, brother, ain't it? Says the man with the puffy hands. He doesn't look me in the eyes. He watches the cigarette. A black car creeps out of the blizzard. Both the make of the vehicle and its governmental plates come from a country that no longer exists. I recognize the car from the years when there used to be a star and sickle on our flag. Those days have passed, yet nothing has changed. A woman wearing a dark lab coat exits the vehicle. She's small in stature, but walks with purpose. Within a couple of quick steps, she's in front of us. Tavarishi, she says. There is storm coming. You do not belong on street. Please, let me take you somewhere warm. Even though her eyes are hidden behind reflective spectacles, I can sense her gaze. She is measuring our character. Not only can I provide food and shelter, I can provide also liquor. Sounds good to me, miss. Lead the way. The man with puffy hands says. The boy and I don't move. Who are you? Asks the boy. Boy, if a kind stranger offers you food and shelter, you just don't ask questions. The man with the puffy hands says. Excuse his manners, miss, we barely know him. It is fair question. The woman says in a voice that doesn't suggest empathy. I am simply charitable soul. I do not believe fellow human beings should have to stand out in cold and suffer. I want to help. Prove it, I say. Buy us a bottle. Her face doesn't twitch. The woman simply processes my request, turns around and walks into the grocer. Well played, brother. The man with the puffy hands says. Well played. The boy's eyes remain glued to the car. Above us, something crackles. The curtain of snow and icy wind thickens. I don't think we should go with her. The boy finally says. Are you mad? The man with the puffy hands replies. She's bringing us what we want. She'll take us somewhere warm. Do you want to freeze here, boy? I've heard rumors. The youth says. I've heard rumors of a car that travels through the streets and picks up the desperate. Those that enter, they're never seen again. Those that enter go to... Before he can finish his thought, the grocer door opens. The woman silently extends a small bottle of vodka in offering to the boy. Are you? 
He struggles to get his words out. Are you taking us to... The wind stops. Above us, the lamplight flickers. In an instant, the woman retracts her gift from the boy and extends the bottle towards the man with the puffy hands. He does not ask questions. He simply drinks. I've heard talk of the place before. An old science facility belonging to an empire that no longer exists. I've heard tales of curses, of abominations, of forbidden knowledge unearthed. For a moment I wonder whether those stories are true. For a moment I consider whether that strange woman might be connected to the haunted place. Yet those thoughts soon leave me. The man with puffy hands passes the bottle to me. There's not much left, yet even the few sips I salvage send tendrils of a hot peace through my chest. The relief, however, is momentary. My thirst is not quenched. It's simply fortified. Tavarishi, just because your young friend won't join us doesn't mean that my offer is off the table. She says. Come with me, and I will bring you to warmth, food, and the drink that you crave. He's not a friend. The man with a puffy hand says as he moves towards the black car. Farewell, boy. The contents of the bottle have convinced me. Even though the motivations of the woman are questionable, the thirst drags me to the car. I do not look back at the boy. A pane of opaque black glass separates us from the driver and the strange woman. The world beyond the windows is deluded into rough silhouettes. As the car starts moving, the man with the puffy hands let out a series of pleased grunts. Helmer. He introduces himself as he takes off his shoes. Hope you don't mind, brother. Been standing upright far too long today. The car fills with the stench of rot. Past the holes in his socks, I can see the pock marks of needles. I do not comment on the smell. Instead, I ask him where he thinks we're being taken. The way that I see, brother, she's going to try to have sex with at least one of us. He says without a shred of irony. Personally, I don't mind. I've been with wars in my younger years, and if she provides what she promises, I'm happy to take one for the course. Before I have a chance to figure out if Almor is being serious or not, the car halts. We were in the city just moments prior, but the land outside of the vehicle is unrecognizable. A moat of frozen water surrounds us. Around it stands sickly, skeletal trees. From beneath the fallen snow, dead shrubbery juts out like clawing fingers of restless corpses. Beyond us stands a concrete shack with a large metal door. The woman makes her way towards the building without looking back. After waiting for Almor to put his shoes back on, we both follow her. The wind outside is brutal, but the thick cement walls of the structure make the elements irrelevant. As soon as the metal doors close behind us, the roar of the blizzard is hushed down beneath the gentle buzz of fluorescent lighting. The inside of the concrete structure is a singular hallway leading to a set of elevator doors. Everything around us echoes the soulless pragmatism of Soviet architecture, yet in one corner of the hallway there's a taste of hospitality, an electric heater, food, drink. Almor immediately leaps at the offerings. Davarishi. I hope you find supplies sufficient for a moment. She says as the red coils of the heater dance across her spectacles. In order to access true shelter, however, I will need some information for your entry paperwork. The process should take less than an hour, and I assure you rooms downstairs are more comfortable than hallway. Is this... The words scratch against my throat. It's as if the universe itself was trying to censure me. Is this... The fluorescent lights above us flicker. The electric heater hisses. She turns to face me. All that I met with is my own miserable reflection. Every fibre of my being wants to let go of the question and indulge in the gifts. But before I can turn away, the woman speaks. We do not live in a just world. She says. This building. The mere existence of the... It alone is evidence of the cruel universe which we inhabit. Horrid research was conducted here many years ago. The earth is still sick with the 
echoes of that dark science. The walls weep for the suffering countless innocents had to face here. Yes, your young friend was correct. This is... Yet he was wrong to assume I mean you harm. Dovarishi, I only want to shield you from the cold and from your cravings. My colleagues who wait below only want to provide good life for you and all others who suffer on the streets. It is only by spreading kindness in these halls, by reasserting our humanity, that we can cleanse the spirit of this inhuman place. Well said, miss. Well said. Almo says as he tears into a packet of melted chocolate bars near the heater. Come sit here, brother. Let us not bother our charitable host more than we have to. I sit down by the heater. The warmth of the machine calms my doubts. With one pull of the bottle, any amount of suspicion dissolves into irrelevance. I give the woman whatever information she requires, as does Elmo. The woman once again tells us to enjoy the food and drink, and then disappears down the elevator to process our paperwork. I reach for the pile of chocolate bars, but instead of unwrapping them, I simply load up my pockets. My stomach is entirely too nervous for food, yet I know what will calm it. I reach for one of the vodka bottles. The seal is broken, and for a split second I question whether the liquor has been tampered with, but with a single taste I forget my worries. My spirit calms. With each pull of the bottle the pain passes from my joints. My mind clears, the world softens around its edges. As my thirst is satiated and I surrender my body to the soothing sharpness of the liquor. Almur continues to ponder about the possibility of being a gigolo, but I do not listen to him. I simply embrace the drunkenness. It's as if an itch in the back of my throat has been scratched, an empty pit in my stomach filled. I feel whole. I feel whole and relaxed and significantly more tired than I thought I was. Almu's drunken mumbles prove to be a steady, low lullaby. I start to nod off. Yet as sleep starts to wrap its fingers around me, another sensation shivers in my chest. Past the sleepy drunken bliss comes a new craving. The cigarette behind my ear. My lungs ask for it. I'm far too tired to open my eyes, let alone light up a cigarette. I try to ignore my chest and listen to Almo's slurred philosophizing, but the hunger for the smoke is too strong. I pry my eyes open and reach for the cigarette. My hand misses. Almo's shoes are off once more. His diseased feet are bloody red in the glare of the heater. He's not speaking anymore, he's just babbling, drifting back and forth through consciousness. My hand misses again. I realize I can't feel my fingers. His head droops as if his neck was broken, but Almore makes an effort to look me in the eye. Brother. He says, struggling with each syllable. Brother, maybe the boy was right. My limbs feel completely foreign to me. I barely managed to get on my feet. Brother, I don't think the beach was honest with us. I think we've been... Poisoned. I try saying the word out loud, but my tongue refuses to move. Instead of words, all that leaves my mouth is spittle. The world is heavy. Each step I take is a discomforting leap of faith, but I will myself towards the metal door. Brother. I hear him moaning, but I don't look back. The path before me spins. Even past the numbness, I can feel a feverish sweat flowing down my back. Brother, what about me? The entirety of my willpower is spent on opening the door. It takes the entire weight of my numb body to move the handle. By the time I feel the freezing wind on my face, I am spent. My body allows for two more steps before it goes limp. The dead shrubbery reaches out for me from the frozen ground. I know I am in no state to escape. I know I can't make it back to the city. The panicked voice of my self-preservation goes quiet. And I know I'm doomed. For a moment I consider crawling back inside and accepting whatever fate the scientist has in store for me, but I'm far too exhausted. I stay outside, leaned up against the partially open door. 
It's cold, but my eyes close regardless. I hope that memories of friends and good nights will keep me warm. And they do. The numbness in my body allows me to relax. I accept my fate and let my mind take me far away from... I remember my schoolyard days, my parents, past loves, a warm summer nights spent in good company. And for a moment, with my mind diminished by the poison in my veins, I almost feel happy. But then, I hear the elevator door open. Almore yells something, but it's incomprehensible. Heavy stomps and the grinding of metal drown his pleas for help out. The thuds from inside the building sober me slightly. I once again consider escaping into the forest, but I find myself unable. Not only am I still seized with the weakness, but my sweaty palms have interwoven themselves with the cold metal of the door. The heavy footfalls stop, but Almor's pleas don't. I hear the woman say something to him, but I can't hear her properly. There's something else in the hallway with them. Something that breathes heavy and low. Something that moves with the sound of grinding gears. I lean over and look inside the building. I gaze into... Adrenaline cuts across my veins like a razor-sharp knife. I see the creature. I see it grab the man with the puffy hands in its drooping maw. The woman in the lab coat watches, calmly taking notes on her clipboard. As the creature feeds, its body expands like a horrid balloon made of flesh. The metal coating around the beast's limbs grinds and snaps as the abomination drains the innocent man. Almur's face twists into a pained grimace. His face grows pale, his hands grow white. The pleas for help stop. The sight of the feeding frenzy awakens a new will to live within my heart. Before the life leaves Almur's eyes, my palms sprout blood. I run. I run through the snow, leaving a part of myself frozen to the metal door. I stumble, and I fall, but my body does not relent. My veins are filled with poison, my coat is caked in blood, yet I do not stop running. I know I'm leaving behind a crimson trail. I know my steps cut a trail through the mountains of snow, but I keep on running. I keep on running because the alternative is incomprehensible. The jagged shrubs give way to sickly woods. The sickly woods strengthen into a healthy forest covered in snow. By the time I reach a road, I cannot run anymore. My heart does not calm, it still demands my legs do whatever they can to escape the cruel woman and her monstrosity. But all I can manage is a staggered walk. By the side of the road, I find an abandoned warehouse. I stumble inside in hopes of survival. The last thing I see before my consciousness fully departs is a group of men gathered around a fire. I dream of the thing. As my body wrestles with the effects of laced alcohol and exhaustion, the visage of the revolting beast refuses to leave me. The grinding of rusted metal strains its way into a universe of throbbing flesh. Incomprehensible shapes of raw meat and arteries haunt me as I drift in and out of consciousness. At times I start to believe I never escape the beast. There's moments within my fevered battle when I'm certain that I've died and my body is simply rattling in some grisly afterlife of oozing flesh and corroded metal. Yet slowly, ever so slowly, sunlight seeps into my world. You're awake. A familiar face with peach fuzz and a bloated eye greets me. <laughs> Thank the Lord you're awake. What a horrid state you came in. I knew that woman was dangerous. My body feels hollow and defeated, but I have control over my limbs once more. In the corner of the warehouse, a group of men warm themselves at a makeshift fire barrel. The boy explains they helped him tend to me after my sickly arrival. He tells me I'm lucky. I agree. As I rediscover control of my body, I also rediscover the candy bars in my pocket. Their packaging seems intact. As I describe Almo's fate to the youth, I offer him some of the chocolates. At first he seems nervous about the food, but we're both too hungry to be paranoid. There are no words to properly capture the maddening form of the beast I'd witnessed. Even past my struggle to verbalize the insanity, however, the youth understands. Sounds like you need a drink. He says. That should help you forget. 
right? We laugh, but the merriment doesn't last. Soon enough, the joke about the thirst becomes an unavoidable part of reality. In a just world, this experience will be enough to make me reject the bottle, but we do not live in a just world. As we walk towards the city, we make idle chatter about the state of the world, yet each gap in conversation grows longer than the last. When we leave the warehouse, the sun is shining in the sky, but by the time we reach the grocer, the heavens are a shapeless sea of grey. The thirst makes sober conversation far too strenuous. We stand outside of the grocer, waiting for a couple of strangers to split a bottle with. We stand outside of the grocer, each holding two fingers to our chest.